NASCAR Now is presented by 5-Hour Energy. And the grandstands are empty today, but they're going to fill up for qualifying and certainly going to be chock full on Sunday for the Brickyard 400. You see the scoring pylon. One driver's going to be at the top there today, denoting the fact that he'll be starting on the pole. And just on the other side of those grandstands, there we are, the ESPN infield pit studio. And we welcome you now inside. Well, we're having a lot of fun today. I'm Mike Massaro, joined by ESPN NASCAR analyst. He's down on the end. That's Brad Doherty. <laughs> And the meat and the sandwich, a couple of drivers in the field this weekend, Denny Hamlin and Jeff Burton. Thanks for being with us, guys. And, and you got to wonder, it's conceivable you two could be battling for this win on Sunday. If you guys are door-to-door -door coming to the checkers, how should we expect you to race each other? I think like we always do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, watch out. Yeah, I'll be watching in my mirror if he's behind me, and I'm sure he'll be looking in his mirror if I'm behind him. It, something tells me there might be some uh, extra aggression. This is, after all, the Brickyard 400, a crown jewel event. Guys, we're going to talk about a lot, of this, uh, a lot of the things going on into this race, but first let's take a look at how final practice went earlier this morning. Guys tuning on their cars, trying to get it. So it is perfect for the beginning of the race. Dale Earnhardt Jr., pretty strong run there. He needs one. His last five races have not been stellar, trying to turn things around. He was 16th fastest. Jimmy Johnson, well, he's been pretty good at the Brickyard over the course of time. Three victories here, and a strong race car, it would appear, after some work. They got it to be 10th in the final practice. Matt Kenseth posted the fastest overall speed on Friday. He tweeted about it afterwards saying that was great, but afterwards it was quite the struggle. Got the car a little bit better today, though. They were eighth overall. Juan Pablo Montoya, well, he's had his moments here in Indianapolis. A couple of near victories gone awry, trying to get to victory lane. Finally, he was sixth in that final practice. Your championship leader, well, he ran only five laps in the final practice, had some obligations on the other side of town, had to get ready for the Nationwide Series race tonight, but Edwards has a pretty strong race car, posted the fifth fastest speed. And it was his teammate in another Ford, Greg Biffle, very fast. He posted the fastest overall speed on Saturday morning in final practice. And here's a look at how things shook out. David Reagan posting the fourth fastest speed. Kurt Busch rounding out your top three. A couple of guys we didn't mention. A.J. Allmendinger also in the seventh spot. And something we didn't see, guys, uh, a couple of highlights of your practice sessions. I want to talk to you, Denny, in particular, uh, facing a little bit of adversity. On Friday in practice, you blew a motor. Can you give us an update on the situation? Yeah, it's just uh, trying to work through it. I, you know, that's our 11th engine failure of the year, and so that's very tough, and especially on a racetrack where, you know, track position is so critical, and we talk about it every week, but this is the number one track position-driven mm -hmm. racetrack uh, that we have. Uh, so immediately we go from, okay, we have an extremely good chance to win this race to, man, mm -hmm. it takes our chances down considerably having to start from the back. Now hopefully we can maybe do some pit strategy or something like that to try to, uh, overcome it, but we know we're going to have a tough road ahead of us. Crazy swing of emotions. How about you, Jeff? Uh, you look pretty solid in practice. Yeah, we were good. We, uh, you know, we, we did not work on qualifying today, so we didn't look very good. Um, early in practice today, I thought we were really good. We made one long run at the end, and we got way too tight. So uh, that was good for us to learn that. We, we made a change on the car, and then we made a, a long run and, and learned something. So it's been, a, it's been a solid weekend. I mean, every, every time on the track, the car's driven well, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited about it. You know, guys, when we look at this racetrack, obviously – Horsepower is key. You got to have a ton of horsepower here. But Denny, I'll start with you, and, and both of you guys answer this for me. Which end of this racetrack? We're talking about one, two, three, or four. Which end of this racetrack do you have to be best on in order to have a chance to win this race? Uh, my opinion, I think most drivers consider uh, down the back stretch and into turn three their passing zone. Um, you know, even though that the track is you know symmetrical and, and one is the same basically as what three is, it seems like more passes are made into turn three than uh, into turn one, and, and definitely more than two and four. So it's just it's one of those corners where everyone kind of spreads out getting uh, into turn two to get that big run down the back straightaway to try to make a pass. Jeff, what about you? What do you I think? feel the same way. It seems like turn two has less grip than all the other corners. So if, if you catch a guy, that's the place to pass because anytime a, a, a corner doesn't have the grip, it's harder to get through there. That's a place you can take advantage of somebody. So the back straightaway and, and getting into three, I agree with Denny, is, is probably the place that most people try to pass. Uh, Denny makes a good point. The place looks symmetrical. 
but it's far from easy. <laughs> it would seem like you need to be incredibly precise at this place to be successful. Well, what's interesting is that if you look at it from a, you know, in a helicopter, it looks the same. You know, turn one looks like turn three, but they're not. They turn three has way more grip than turn one and turn four has way more grip than turn two. There's actually more banking in that end of the racetrack mm -hmm. than this end. So you can't tell it by looking at it, but there's, you know, the three and four side of the racetrack is, is radically different than one and two. Not radically, but it, for, for this racetrack, it's pretty different. Dale Jarrett said on our set earlier this week, he said if he missed his mark going into turn one by a foot or maybe two feet, it messed up his whole lap. What do you think? Uh, it, it, to me, it's a half a second, especially when we go out here wow. to qualify. Um, it is so critical, and, and a lot of the time, you'll see guys that run up front. Those are the guys that hits their marks. That It's not necessarily the best race cars, but it's the guy that just hits his mark but is on that ragged edge throughout the entire lap. Uh, and you'll see some of the fastest cars that go later on that had one of the best cars yesterday. If they miss that line by that much, mm. they're, they're going to be wow. mid-pack. You know, we're seeing more and more guys, especially this season, the cars are so close. I mean, you're even looking at guys. Last week we were looking at times, the second-place car, Back to the 22nd place car, they basically run the same speed. So saying that, how important, uh, and we've mentioned it a little bit, is track position here. I mean, you have to basically have great track it's, position. You know, for whatever reason, it's harder to pass today than it's ever been. And we, yeah. You know, there's a lot of reasons for that. The main reason is there's so many people running the same speed. Yeah. If, you look at, if you look at the speeds from today, you really analyze it, there's, there's 20 cars that are in that garage that feel like they can win this race. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how close it is. So if you're, if you're 10th, in that 20 car pack, how do you pass the guy in ninth? You know, it's yeah. very difficult. And so the, the, the competition's harder, and aerodynamically, I think these cars are, are harder to pass, too. You know, back in the day, if you had a faster car, you just pass people. Yeah. I mean, honestly, yeah. and it's, it's just way harder to do that today. Yeah. You know, we, we've been talking throughout the course of the weekend about the Fords. They've looked awfully fast. Can, can the Chevys, can the Toyotas match up with the horsepower they're bringing this weekend? Yeah, I think so. And, um, you know, for me, it, you know, like Jeff was saying, you, you have the top 20 and you look at the times. And honestly, you take any one of those guys in the top 20 mm -hmm. and place their car in front of the pack with 10 laps to go, as long as he hits his mark, there's no reason why he shouldn't win the race. Even if he has the mm. 20th fastest car, it's just it means that much to be out front. Wow. So that's wow. why it's, it's completely a wild card race in, in the sense of that, you know, who's going to end up taking the lead off pit road with that, on that final stop? Because that's going to be the guy more than likely you're going to have to beat. Well, wow. this is just the beginning of our conversation with Denny Hamlin and Jeff Burton. Still more to come here on NASCAR. Now, don't go away, folks. We still have plenty left under the hood. There have been a rash of crew chief changes recently. Why are so many teams making moves now, and what will the impact be moving forward? Jimmy Johnson is a three-time Indy winner, but Brickyard success has not always come easy for the champ. Jack Canals tells us how things have gone so far this weekend. And after disappointment in 2009, a Chip Ganassi team was in victory lane in 2010. Ganassi talks about the emotional roller coaster of the last two brickyards. There's your yard of bricks. Lots of people will be kissing that. Fans can do it, and drivers, only That's one, right will be able to do it at the end. Lots of drivers signing autographs, including your championship leader, Carl Edwards. A busy day for him qualifying this afternoon. He also has the Nationwide Series race later tonight. Trevor Bain involved as well. Silly season has begun, at least for crew chiefs. Lots of swapping in the last few weeks. That includes Pat Trison being re replaced by Chad Johnson as Martin Truex Jr.'s crew chief. Greg Irwin found himself relieved of his duties as crew chief of the 16 team. The new man in charge, Matt Pusha, who had crew chief for Roush Fenway in Nationwide and Truck Series action. It didn't take long for Irwin to find another job. He replaced Mike Shiplett as A.J. Allmendinger's crew chief. Those two have made their debut here this weekend in Indy. Same can be said for Juan Pablo Montoya and his new guy, Jim Pullman. Pullman replaces Brian Patty. And the latest job casualty is Todd Barriers. Jeff Burton will now have Luke Lambert atop his pit box. He was the team's former engineer. And Jeff, I guess we start there with you. Uh, a big change in your camp. What are your thoughts on it? Well, I mean, you know, we're 25th in points and, and uh, really weren't seeing any improvement. So, I mean, we had to do something. I, you know, Todd has worked exceptionally hard. It's not that he didn't care. It hadn't worked. It just wasn't working. So, you know, when you're when you're this far along in the year and then you couple that with the our end of last year, I mean, the numbers are the numbers and it is what it is. So uh, it was time to do something different. Denny, how, how, where are you and Mike Ford at? You know, at the beginning of the season, everyone had great expectations for you guys of coming out of the block and winning races and doing all that. And then there was little grumblings. But it seems like you guys have stayed pretty solid throughout this. Where, where's your relationship with Mike Ford? 
It's good. I mean, he knows me, and, yeah. and so uh, you know, in in my opinion, he's he's not going anywhere for a very long time. Sure. So, sure. Um, he's just uh, you know, regardless of the good times or the bad times, you know, a lot of people's careers have ups, uh, ups and downs and things like that. Um, we've been pretty even keel really through uh, my five year career, and I feel like uh, he's been a, a lot of the reason for that. So he's he's my guy no matter what, and um, you know, I'll be sticking by him for a long time. Yeah. And guys, this is a tough sport. I mean, you spent a lot of time with your crew chief over a, a grueling period of time, 10, 11 months, and there's testing in the off season. I mean, it, it's easy to see where a relationship could go sour. How do you keep that from happening? How do you, how do you maintain that relationship, work through problems, and keep it from getting stale? Well, hey, listen, you have to communicate. You have, you have to be honest with each other. You have to be able to t have the difficult conversations. Uh, you know, this sport's hard, and you're going, like Denny said, you go through these periods that are of downtime. There's nobody in, in any sport, any career, any business that everything's always good. When things aren't good, how you respond to those things, how, you know, how you can work together through tough times really means a lot. But, but ultimately, it's about how well you run. Mm -hmm. Because if you run well, it covers a lot of stuff up. There's a lot of things can be dealt with if you run well. When you're not running well, that's when relationships really, really get tested. Uh, the key to all of it is making lap time and being able to go fast and finish well. You do those things, everything's good. Well, and it's very difficult because uh, uh, the crew chief is like a, a coach, you know, a head coach in any other sport. And so when things don't go <laughs> extremely well, it seems like you know, things kind of fall on him. But uh, how's the morale of your race teams? I know, Jeff, you, like you said, you've got a big change mm -hmm. coming into Indy here. It's a huge platform, one of the premier events. What's the morale of your race team like? Well, that race team morale is really good. I mean, we, we gave someone internally a chance. You know what yeah. I mean? We took a young guy, 28 years old, uh, full of energy. Everybody mm -hmm. likes him. Uh, everybody gets along with him. And instead of bringing somebody from the outside in, we gave him a chance. So, sure. so everybody in the company is, feels really good about that. Um, you know, and you're right. We, the one thing that I don't think we do as good a job as we need to is be a team. Yeah. You know, professional athletics are about being a team. Right. And there's a lot of stuff that – the drivers are away from the team a lot more than we ever have been. And I think the crew chief's role, as far as being that coach, being that leader, motivational guy, I think that means a great deal. Yeah. This is a grueling schedule, and mm -hmm. that guy's got to be able to motivate That's people. Right. How about you, Denny? The mood in your camp, I mean, you, you guys are, are fighting, clawing your way toward a chase berth. What's it like right now over at the eleven? Well, for us personally, it, it's, it's tough because, you know, I, I feel for my guys, obviously, it, the road guys and things like that, you know, they, they get just as down when we blow an engine as, as I do. And so we're, we really are one team. Uh, a lot of the guys, the mechanics that are working on my 11 car are the guys that were working on my 20 nationwide car uh, in 2005 when I first came to Joe Gibbs Racing. So we're a very, very tight group. Uh, but, you know, it, it's just it, you feel bad because these guys each mm. week are having to switch motors out and, and things like that. It's just so frustrating. But, you know, we're, we're going to win together and we're going to lose together. And, and, and regardless, we're going uh, to be a family in the end. And, Jeff, you make a good point. We've talked a little bit here about, about your new crew chief. Uh, it's never easy to start over with a new crew chief. What's it like having to do that at a place like this with so much pressure and so much prestige on the line? Well, you know what? There is a lot of prestige on the line. But if, if there's any more pressure for this race, you didn't prepare for the last race properly. I mean, every race is as imp the, the race you're at is the most important race in the world. And if this race, for some reason, there's more pressure around this race, then you sure didn't have enough pressure on you at New Hampshire. Hmm. And that's my opinion. So certainly when the race is over and you're able to pick up, you know, a Southern 500 trophy or a Daytona 500 trophy or an Indy trophy, that, that means a great deal. But you can't prepare for it any differently than you did the race before. What about the points this year, guys? I mean, how do you feel about the, the new point system? Have you seen uh, the difficulty in gaining and losing points and those types of things, Danny? What's the, what's the point structure look like to you? What do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, honestly, after, you know, probably the six or seven weeks I've had, you know, really been consistently fighting for wins, yeah. and I find myself still 10th in points, yeah. it's like, gosh, you know, <laughs> either those guys up front have been really, really good and consistent, or, or it's just a hard hole to dig out of, you know, the, especially starting so fa far back in points like we were earlier this season, so it's an extremely hard hole to dig out of, but like Jeff says, winning cures everything, you yeah. know, you, you get yourself a chase spot uh, with a win as long as you're in that top 20, and um, you know, we see guys, you know, it's a constant buildup. Look at the excitement mm -hmm. that we're creating over uh, Brad Keselowski, who's 22nd oh, yeah. in points. Yeah. He's got a chance to make the chase 22nd in points yeah. with seven races or six races to go. So it's, uh, it, it's wide open, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with you, And uh, which brings me to my next question. Uh, you guys find yourselves in different positions and, and, and basically probably different strategies in these final seven regular season races. How do you approach them considering the situations you're in? 
Well, we just, we're just trying to get better. I mean, to be blunt about it, I mean, we, you know, six weeks ago I was saying, hey, you know, we can still make the chase if we go win a couple of races. But where we are right now, if we won a couple of races, I'm still not sure that's going to do it. I mean, we've gotten ourselves in such a hole. Like digging out of the hole in this point system is very, very difficult. So what we're trying to do is improve. I mean, we're coming to this racetrack trying to do better than we did last week. And, and if we do that, then we'll eventually get ourselves where we need to be. But we're not really thinking about the chase or the championship. What we're thinking about is being better as a race team. Danny, you are thinking about the chase. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to look too far ahead because ultimately if we're, we're not reliable, we're not going to find ourselves in the chase. Uh, so we've got to get our reliability uh, you know, back in order um, with our team. And if we can do that, we're as dangerous as anyone. I, I would not uh, bet against us those final ten races. All right, guys. Well, thank you for joining us today on the set of NASCAR Now. We wish you the best of luck this weekend. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. All right, folks, don't go away. We still have plenty to come here on the show. Still ahead, Roger Penske.